that's always the awkward part when it goes live and you're like uh, we're supposed to keep talking yeah oh is that is that kind of the uh is that like the norm is that like the um what am i trying to say like that's the appropriate thing to do that's the expected thing to do is just be chatting no actually when i get on a lot of webinars that we're not doing the reality is nobody's talking and you're just kind of quietly staring at each other really awkward and everybody gets to watch you do that right so, yeah <laughs> I think I'm supposed to look super busy, like oh, I'm writing something down. Let me just thumb through some notes. No, if you just give your stoic face, it positions you perfectly under your gladiator helmet. Oh yeah. And that that's usually what works. There Ever since you said that's a replica from Italy with leather on the inside, I seriously yeah. want to put it on. <laughs> For real. And the thing is, is it, I mean, I've got a selfie in it and I look really good, like really good. I, I get to see that. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, we do have, uh, we got a bunch of people joining. Um, we'll give it maybe one or two more minutes. So, sure. yeah. We can keep going. Um, we're definitely not over time to start. If we want to give it a few more minutes, I think we'll be great. Yeah. So, Arizona, California is officially caught up to Arizona in time yes again and yeah, we may never go back bounces around us i don't know well I don't, I don't know that you can say that arizona is holding anything down for the rest of the country but uh <laughs> the thing is is i guess i guess the whole point of the daylight savings was to like obviously offer more daylight hours in normal times but the thing is is it's like Arizona didn't want more working time in the dead heat of the summer, so they don't they don't spring forward the hour because all that does is make more dead of the heat summertime waking hours. Everybody likes to get up and do stuff super early when it's not as hot anyway. So yeah, well, you do live uh, at the the gates of Mordor uh, yeah. during the summer, <laughs> so you know there there is that, right? For real. It's funny yeah. because last Saturday we were doing one of those things with my wife's business and we were like outside and it got to be 93 degrees last Saturday. <laughs> and, and everybody that we would talk to is like, Oh, is it back? It's back. Like just seems like it never went away. It's already back. So. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, kick us off here. I see a lot of people, um, dropping in we've already got one fan only one from the ohio state thanking you for your amazing banner was that denise is that who said that yeah dennis. she's my favorite she's my favorite oh it's dennis i'm sorry it, it, and like, he's he's now very offended at you yeah no it, you know what i saw it on the screen and then it just like disappeared as soon as i looked and that was kind of what i thought i couldn't tell so yeah dennis yeah. You and i right there buddy oh h yeah oh. Hey guys, uh, for those of you that are watching, we can't uh, obviously see your faces, but if you would uh, give us a shout out, tell us where you're from, uh, where you're tuning in from uh, this evening, we'd appreciate that. Um, love to see uh, where everybody's coming in from. And uh, we're going to get started here. Uh, we respect your time. We appreciate that you're hanging out with us tonight. Uh, I am Michael Cohen, uh, CEO, founder at Awaken to Sleep. And we are one of the two sponsors tonight, along with Somnomed, uh, to ask Dr. Greg Manning to impart his nuggets of wisdom on the topic of home sleep testing. There are many ways to do home sleep testing, and there are probably a few uh, that you can do right in your practice. So he's going to give us uh, nuggets on this topic tonight. Uh, our goal is to be uh, both entertaining and educational. Uh, it is a PACE, uh, AGD PACE um, event. So that means you guys are going to get a CE for tonight. Um, so I'll uh, let Dr. Manning uh, take it away in just a moment, but I have to do as a CE event, have to do the quick disclaimers. Uh, Waking to Sleep and Somnomed are for-profit companies. We are sponsoring the education tonight because we believe in uh, Dr. Manning's ability to help you guys. And uh, we, that's why we're here. Um, that being said, at the end of the webinar this evening, 
We will have a link that's posted as soon as we meet the criteria uh, for the PACE timeline. Uh, we will post that in the chat. So there's a link to the survey in the chat. If you guys would click on that, that would be fantastic. If you miss the link for some reason in the chat, you will get an email by 7 p.m. Pacific time tonight with a link to click that survey and get your CE certificate by 7 p.m. Pacific time this evening. If you don't have an email in your inbox at 7 p.m. Pacific time, it's in your spam. And that does happen from time to time. So please check that before you hit us at uh, info at awakenedsleep.com. We would appreciate it. Uh, we are here to serve you guys and have some fun tonight. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Greg Manning. Since he is hilarious and humble, I will sing his uh, praises for a minute. He's been in dental sleep medicine for over a decade. Uh, he is currently in Gilbert, Arizona, in a general dentistry practice that also does sleep dentistry and medical billing successfully. He has been hacking through the forest for quite some time, and uh, he's got plenty of stuff to give us. So, Dr. Manning, I will be here all evening, and I'm sure we will be going back and forth, but without further ado, I want to hand it off to you. Awesome. Thanks. Can you hear me still, Mike? Am I good to go? No crazy yep. buzzing or anything. All right. Well, let's do it then. Um, welcome to everybody that's coming to the sh to the um, webinar tonight. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Michael and and Chad over at Awaken to Sleep for sponsoring tonight's event. Also, Somnomed. Um, I love me some Somnomed and appreciate them sponsoring this tonight as well. Um, tonight we're going to be talking, and there's so many topics that you could hit if you're only going to do an hour. And tonight's topic is going to be on sleep testing and in more importantly, home sleep testing that you can do like in your own practice. The idea is that we're gonna take little chunks of, of sleep medicine and try to incorporate those into your sleep medicine practice, your dental sleep medicine practice at home. And while we are gonna just kind of broach a couple of small topics, the main topic for today is gonna be making sure that we test, um, do home testing in our practice. Now, it says home sleep testing in your dental practice the right way. Um, it probably should say just like the way I do it. There may be other ways to do it, but for today and today only, this is the right way to do it. Um, the idea we want to do is just demystify everything. You know, um, we do some weekend courses and the, the idea bet between behind these two day courses is that we try to just take the mystery out of sleep medicine so that it becomes doable and it becomes a system in your practice. So today let's talk a little bit about the purpose of getting home sleep testing up and running in your practice. I would imagine the reason why most of us are here today and they got on a webinar about home sleep testing is because maybe that's a roadblock for you right now. Maybe you feel like that is going to be the thing that will push your practice uh, from a dental sleep medicine standpoint to the next level. Um, I'm here to say that I believe home sleep testing that is offered to your patients is probably one of the biggest um, hurdles, but also one of the biggest um, boons to your practice when it comes to dental sleep medicine. I think that will accelerate anybody's dental sleep medicine practice almost more than just about anything else. So when we talk about testing and sleep, um, we can test for a lot of different things. Uh, and I say we, I mean, patients can have tested a lot of different things. There's over 90 sleep related disorders, anything from insomnias and hypersomnias, circadian rhythms, sleep-wake disorders, parasomnia, sleep movements like restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movements, those kind of things. Um, let's not forget everybody, uh, lest we forget we are just tooth guys. You know, we're not real doctors, we're just sort of like oral custodians or, or tooth janitors. Obviously I kid, but we do need to be careful about which sort of avenues we decide that we want to get involved in when it comes to the medical world because we want to make sure that we're staying in the scope of our practice. So for today, we're going to just say that there are a lot of disorders that happen during sleep. That being said, far and away the most common sleep disorder or especially sleep-related breathing disorder is obstructive sleep apnea, sort of where we choke ourselves out while we're trying to sleep at night. And because this is the most common, it is one that we can test specifically for. Um, 
one little lead into our testing. Why is it important? Why should we be testing? Is this statistic right here that there's 30 million people that are suffering from obstructive sleep apnea and so many of them don't even know it. They're suffering with symptoms, they're suffering with comorbidities, and they don't know that it's related to obstructive sleep apnea. Those that have been diagnosed, that number is about 3 million people have been diagnosed. And what's even worse than that is out of those that have been diagnosed, only about 750,000 of those are being actively treated. And so the, the chance for us to step in and help is really awesome. You know, when I first got into this, and I'll get into my story a little bit later, but when I first got into dental sleep medicine, I kind of just wanted to take those patients that were the difference in the 3 million and the 750,000, those people that have been diagnosed already. I didn't want to play around with any testing. I didn't want to play around with trying to shuffle people to testing centers. I just wanted people that already had a test. They weren't using their CPAP machine and I could help them with an oral appliance. And that's the way I started and it was fine and it was great and we made some money and we got some experience. But moving past that, I started thinking like, well, geez, I'm helping these people already this to kind of bridge the gap between um, their CPAP machine and an oral appliance. Why can't I do that same thing for all of these people that are suffering that are in my practice and maybe they don't even know it. So the question becomes who has sleep apnea? Who in our practice has sleep apnea? Well, unfortunately, it's not like spotting a toupee. That's a pretty easy get. You can see those guys coming a mile away. But in our dental practices, those with sleep apnea may be a little harder to identify. Um, one of the things we wanna be really careful with is identifying somebody so solely based on the way they look. Now, if we're being honest, if you have like a big, heavy barrel chested guy with a lot, like a heavy neck, there's a really good chance that he has sleep apnea, but we've treated ladies that are in their 30s and 40s that weigh 130 pounds just anatomically are set up to where the hyoid bone lets the the jaw fall backwards and the hyoglossal muscle when it relaxes and they kind of choke themselves out and they snore like freight trains and they're these cute little 30 somethings so we want to be really really careful about not making judgments strictly based on looks one of the things that we can do is we can start talking to our patients a little bit more about the complications that come along with sleep apnea. You know, there at the bottom, we talk about obesity. And while it is true that a lot of times people that will lose weight will do better um, from a sleep standpoint, sometimes the obesity is a result of poor sleep as, as you know, we get in, without getting too far into the weeds, you know, the release of cortisol that happens during a sympathetic nerve response while, while we're choking ourselves out at night can lead to that kind of stuff. But some of these other things are things that we should be talking to our patients about in a screening protocol about, you know, drowsiness and fatigue. You know, are you having morning headaches? You know, are you having um, memory loss or this brain fog? There's a lot of things that we could be talking to our patients about if we, if we suspect that they might have sleep apnea. One of the biggest screening tools, and again, I say screening, and we wanna make sure that we're delineating today between screening and diagnosing because screening is the S word and we're all about the S word. We're just full of S word. Um, and that is us screening our patients, but we do not wanna play around with the D word. We wanna be really careful when we talk about diagnostics and we're gonna get into that in just a minute. But when we look at this, the, the complications that we have from sleep apnea are things that we can talk to our patients about in sort of a screening type of way. Now, what are some of the things that we might ask them? Obviously, we can ask them if we suspect things based on what we're seeing intraorally and what we're seeing um, that might lead us to ask some of those questions. But the big one might be health history for them. You know, the health history would tell us a lot. You know, when we start looking at patients with sleep apnea, so many of them have these comorbidities at such a high percentage. For example, drug-resistant hypertension. If you have a patient that's having trouble controlling their blood pressure, you know, 83% of those uh, by statistic are gonna have some level of sleep apnea. Obviously those people that would be considered obese, three quarters of all of those patients and also three quarters of congestive heart failure patients and type two diabetes patients. These are super common comorbidities um, of patients with obstructive sleep apnea. So this is the way we find those patients. This is the way that we're going to help identify these patients. Now that's great and everything, but identifying these patients 
is just kind of step one. Now, as a general dentist, I've identified patients. We place a few implants in our practice here and there, and I've identified patients that need implants, and I've identified patients that from maybe a periodontal perspective would do well with, with orthodontics, but that doesn't mean everybody's doing it. I mean, I'd, I wished everybody that I identified for uh, needing implants just pulled the trigger on implants or everybody that identified as needing clear aligner therapy or something like that jumped all over. Heck, I'd even be happy if everybody identified with cavities got them filled. But unfortunately, there's always a gap somewhere between identifying a need and getting that need taken care of. And so when we talk about that gap being bridged between them needing something and us getting there, there's hundreds and thousands of dollars spent every year in CE to places like homily and some of these patient patient treatment planning seminars to try to get us to bridge that gap and get people to say yes to treatment in our dental practices. Well, we do that because of this gap, this gap between identifying a patient that needs help and us getting them excited for the help or us expressing the value to them in a certain way so that they they feel like they want to have our help. The same is true when it comes to our obstructive sleep apnea patients. We can identify these patients a lot. We can start to ask questions and start to identify patients that may be suffering from this. We can even identify people that may have been tested in the past, but does that get us to treatment? Um, does that get us to helping these patients with oral appliance therapy? Screening protocol is going to be a, a completely different webinar. You can spend hours and hours on a screening protocol with your hygiene team and your front office team and you, and you kind of captaining these teams to try to create a screening protocol that identifies these patients in your practice. But unfortunately, we're going to have to table that for today because we had a lot to get to in terms of, of home testing and just testing in general. So just know that any time we get ready to test somebody that they've been through some kind of screening protocol um, without going into a lot of detail. Um, so once we've gone through a screening protocol and we've identified patients that we feel like should be tested to see if they have sleep apnea, we have a couple of choices. Now, one of the things that I like to talk to say in these webinars, because it makes me sound really funny, um, no, it doesn't. It, well, maybe it does. I don't know. You guys be the judge. What I, what I will say is that when we screen people, um, we kind of are almost telling these patients based on health history, intraoral findings, you know, questions that we ask, responses that they give, maybe some screening things, maybe, again, intraoral signs and symptoms. We may start to formulate an idea in our head that well, this is starting to sound a little bit like uh, an apnea duck and it's quacking like an apnea duck and it walks like an apnea duck. Is this truly a sleep apnea duck? Well, all of these things that are in the screening realm are just that. They're just screening. That's us saying, well, it sounds like a duck and it walks like a duck, it swims like a duck, but do we know if it's a duck or not? We don't. There is no way that we can ever tell if somebody has sleep apnea unless we test them while they're sleeping. That's the big take home. Woo! We can talk about a lot of things, we can assume a lot of things, but until we get a test with that patient sleeping, we will never know if they have sleep apnea. So that's a big take home from today, um, is we have to make sure that we're catching our diagnosis while they're sleeping. So now we just use the D word, diagnosis. How do we get our diagnosis? We have to test when they're asleep. So there's a couple of ways to do that. We can have the patients test at home, or we can have the patients test at a sleep lab. Um, the HST stands for home sleep test, and PSG stands for polysomnogram. Um, the polysomnogram, we'll call it the gold standard. The reason being is that it, there's a lot of pros and cons, which we'll get into in just a minute, but the biggest one is that it's gonna have so many channels. If you're having trouble with sleeping, there's so many things that it can test at the same time. It can be testing for hypersomnias and insomnias. It can be testing for um, periodic limb movements and, and odd type breathing that may not fall in the category of obstructive sleep apnea. Now, albeit most of those, again, are quite rare, obstructive sleep apnea being sort of the king of the mountain, 90% of all of these sleep problems 
are related to obstructive sleep apnea, a polysomnogram is still going to capture all of those things. So, okay, Mrs. Truly, we want you to relax and get a good night's sleep and we'll evaluate any sleep issues you have. This is the classic joke about a polysomnogram is that they're not in their own bed and they are hooked up to a lot of things. They're sort of plugged into the wall here and they're, there's kind of a what do they call it? First night syndrome, where you sleep a first night someplace, we don't get a good night's sleep because we're everything's so foreign and new to us. So there's a lot of things that go into a polysomnogram. The thing that would bug me the most is you can't bring your own pillow. I think they're worried about bed bugs or something like that, but you can't bring your own pillow in. I'm sort of a pillow diva when it comes to that. So the one upside to the polysomnogram is all of the channels. It can check for a lot of different things. These channels can check not only for airflow and effort for sleep apnea, but can also check for, um, you know, you, you get your ECG, EMG, they're snoring. You've got just a lot of different things that they can check for during this night's sleep. Um, the process for getting somebody tested if we're going to go the route of a polysomnogram is that we identify again these patients. We make a referral to an accredited sleep lab that offers polysomnograms. They go in, they get hooked up to a lot of stuff like you can see right here on this guy in the bottom. And most of the time, the the people that are issuing a polysomnogram will initiate a CPAP machine or some kind of PAP therapy in the night to see how much pressure it takes to open them up. And they might start them on a CPAP or they may send them back to your office for an oral appliance. This is you having the patient identified and ready to go, sending them to a third party, having them hooked up to these and sleep in a sort of a hospital clinic type setting, and then potentially having them go to a CPAP machine or an oral appliance afterwards. Now, the pros of this is that it's very comprehensive. The other pro, which some people might feel like is a con, but it is attended by a technician, meaning that if something's going off the rails or something's kind of going awry, they can write that ship immediately because they're right there, sort of big brother, making sure everything's going right. And it's in a very controlled environment. The cons are some of those that we just talked about. It's really an uncomfortable environment. You're gonna, it's more of a hospital type setting, even though they make them try to feel more like a hotel setting. Um, it is a little difficult to sleep. Patients don't want to do this, unfortunately. And this is, again, pulling on 10 years, 11 years of sleep experience in my practice is that when we would send patients for polysomnograms, we sort of leave it up to the patient, like, okay, here you go, go get her done. And so often they would say like, okay, I'll go get her done. And then you see them for their six month cleaning and they say like, ah, you know, I was cleaning my room and I forgot. So the compliance for this is a huge con in us establishing a dental sleep medicine practice. We cannot treat these people if they have not been tested. And so if their compliance for getting a PSG done is low, it really puts a like a real slowdown on our sleep medicine practice. Um, again, just weird sleep conditions and this first night effect where it's just a foreign place. So sometimes we don't even under the best conditions, we don't sleep well in a place like that so hey dr nope. manning yes uh, just before you move on to the home sleep testing which i know is our our emphasis tonight we got a question how you've obviously been doing this for a while you've referred patients into the sleep center before how do you handle it when they do end up going and they come back to you with a cpap or the physician that they went to go see their primary care doctor said yeah your dentist is wrong you don't need a test so obviously those are probably not meant in, uh, you know, as a deliberate offense, obviously, but sure. how do you, how do you handle that as the patient's dentist who was basically undermined in, in some form or fashion? Well, so there's two different things on the table, right? We have patients that are going for a sleep study and then they come back with a CPAP. I'm actually okay with that. Again, the, the goal here is to get people treated so they don't die. Um, a lot of times they'll go to these sleep tests and they will initiate PAP. What that means is they'll start them on a pressure to see if they respond well and at what pressure they respond to a CPAP. And sometimes for those patients that are severe, and this is getting out of a little bit of the topic of tonight, for patients that are severe, I recommend that they do a CPAP anyway and we send them for a CPAP. So if they're severe, great, take a CPAP. Um, the one thing that I kind of hang my hat on is that if a patient is mild or moderate and I can treat them very easily in my practice with an oral appliance and they get into a CPAP machine. I feel bad for the patient because they got talked into a CPAP machine by somebody else. Um, 
when really they were kind of looking to have an oral appliance but so many, like a very, very high percentage of those patients end up not tolerating the CPAP and they come to us yeah. anyway. Um, I always ask for their test afterwards for those patients mm -hmm. that they put on CPAP. I ask for their test and then I let them know the alternative to that if they're mild or moderate. And if they're severe, I say, keep plugging away, try to get used to that thing. Now, the second is a little bit more sticky, which is if you recommend that they have a sleep test and the physician doesn't. Uh, full disclosure, this has actually only happened to me one time. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that I see a ton. In fact, because the physicians are so busy trying to see a volume of patients in order to stay profitable, it's one of the things that really slips between the cracks in, in sort of a general physician way to where I think sometimes, and at least in my follow-up with some of the physicians, when I send them reports back, I, I feel like a lot of them are, are sort of grateful that we kind of initiated this process because they should have probably as a general physician been asking these questions and moving them through this type of thing, but they didn't. So they're happy that somebody did and they're happy to jump on. The one time it did happen, I just told the patient, I said, look, I would love a chance to chat with your physician because there may be a couple of things that we saw more from a dental perspective than, than he may have be seeing just from a general health perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd love to chat with him. I never chatted with him. Of course, he never wanted to put it together. Uh, oddly enough, patient accepted a home test and we just kind of moved along and they actually did have moderate apnea. So nana, nana, boo, boo, stick your head in doo doo. Um, for them. <laughs> So uh, on that note, I'll get out of your way for the. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't recommend here. the nana, nana, boo, boo, stick your head and do new approach to, to talking with physicians, but um, it, it, it is actually not as, as big of a thing, but I would, I would just say right away, if a physician questions you, I would tell the patient, I would love to talk to your physician. I've even, when I had that happen, I actually gave the patient my cell phone number and said, look, if you want to do that, or I wouldn't even go as far as maybe calling their office and saying, hey, we, we have a mutual patient. I'd love to have a, a quick peer chat one-on-one -on -one with Dr. So-and-so and just let them know what you found. Let them know why you're recommending that. Because again, we're only recommending these sleep tests um, as an effort to try to help the patients. And we're only recommending them because we feel like it might help them with their overall health, which is what the general physician wants anyway. Now, occasionally you might get one that's overly prideful and, and doesn't want to play that game. And at that point, you know, you're going to be at a crossroads. You're going to be at a standstill. So luckily it's not something that happens super frequently. Now, that first scenario where somebody goes out to a polysomnogram and they initiate PAP therapy on them during that night of sleep and they give them a CPAP, um, that is one of the sort of, one of the cons that we don't list. Um, obviously it's business that walks out of your office. And again, we're here to help people and, and we don't want to focus so much today on the business of it. That's a fun topic for another day is focusing on the business side of things and, and what revenue it can bring to your practice because it can be a real nice little shot in the arm from a, from a financial standpoint. But that kind of starts going away when we, when we start looking at home sleep testing. At that point, we're not leaving somebody to go be a free agent signed by somebody else, right? You know, hey, I'm going to send you out as a free agent to some other place and they have a chance to, to sign you as a free agent to a CPAP machine or something like that. So this gives us sort of, to, uh, like most of us dentists, we're like type A or maybe even A plus because we're better than that personalities. Um, this gives us the ability to sort of have control over the whole process. Um, while still keeping ourselves doing the things that are proper and legal, but still having the control to sort of quarterback the whole process. So now a home sleep test has far, far fewer channels than a polysomnogram. Again, the home sleep test is going to be offered to our patients that we identify as potentially having through our screening protocol, having a sleep related breathing disorder we start looking at those things that are very, very common with patients with obstructive sleep apnea in our screening. And so really we're just testing them for, or having them tested for sleep apnea or even more so obstructive sleep apnea. So we don't need the channels to check for periodic limb movements. We don't need the channels that are gonna check for, uh, you know, some other kind of weird thing that they might be doing at night, hypersomnias or some sort of REM disorder where you show up at Walmart in the middle of the night in your bathrobe kind of thing. We're just checking for obstructive sleep apnea. 
So it does have the channels for snoring and airflow. It has an effort belt that goes around the sort of the bottom part of the chest to check for effort and breathing. It has oxygen um, saturation sensors. Um, it does check heart rate and also body position. Most of them check for body position. So uh, because we have so far fewer channels, um, it becomes a lot more of a comfortable type of test. But above all of the comfort of just having a smaller um, hookup on us um, and less invasive kind of hookup, we get to do this in our own bed where we're very comfortable sleeping with our own pillow for pillow divas out there. I know you're out there with me. Um, that becomes a lot more of a doable approach for the patient. Um, there are two types of home sleep study models. There is an in-house home sleep study model and a third party home sleep testing model. Uh, in the in-house, obviously you would own and operate your own equipment where you would send your equipment home with the patients. They can test, they bring it back to your office. You upload that into a portal and you send that to a board certified sleep physician to read and interpret and give their advice on what we should do next. That makes it real easy for us. We didn't diagnose, we just gave them a test. That test gave back data. And we sent that data to somebody who knows what they're talking about, like a real doctor, you know, and that real doctor happens to be a board certified sleep physician. And then they send us back a report. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, the third party home sleep testing model is similar, but the patient goes home and they have a home sleep um, test mailed to them with a video on how to use it. They use it and then they mail it back to the place where it came from, and then they have it read there, and then the report comes to your office. Both of those are nice for the patient because they are um, able to sleep in their own beds. It's far less invasive than, than a polysomnogram. We'll talk about the difference in home sleep testing models um, where you own the equipment and do it in-house and also the third-party model as we go through tonight. So let's start with the in-house model. Um, some of the pros and cons are a faster workflow. I want to spend just a little bit of time on this faster workflow. Um, when we talk to our patients in a screening protocol and we, and we start to identify that these patients may be a sleep apnea type of patient that we want to find out if they are, they're quacking like a duck and they're, they're sort of walking like a duck and we want to find out if they're really a duck, we can get them sort of motivated for that right then, excuse me, and then send them home with a test right then. While the motivation's fresh, while the information's fresh in their head, they're ready to go, boom, send it home with them right at that appointment and then they come back the next day and it's over. So that workflow happens a lot quicker. There's, there's those, those barriers, sort of that pay to play kind of goes away. Um, it can also be a little bit of an internal revenue source for you and an increased production. Well, I do not charge a whole bunch for a home sleep test. Uh, full disclosure, we charge $175 all in for things that I have to write checks for, which we disposables that we don't reuse, stuff like nasal cannula, we throw those away. And um, the interpretation by the sleep physician, that's less than $100. All of my cost is less than $100 on that. We charge $175. There's not a ton of chicken on that bone, but it makes patients saying yes really easy. If they say yes to that and they have sleep apnea, they will say yes to the oral appliance. And really at the end of the day, for us, the real help that we offer the patients is with the oral appliance, but also, again, a topic for another day, the real money to be made from a business standpoint is in the oral appliance fabrications and follow-ups, not so much in the sleep test. So if we can get that sleep test as a barrier out of our way, we can get onto the more important stuff and that's actually treating them. More important to the patient because they're treated, but more important to our business because it's profitable. Um, Again, you have more control through the process because this all belongs to you. These patients likely are your patients or they're becoming your patients. Um, but it also gives us the chance to communicate with other people's physicians, let them know what we're doing down the road that can lead to referrals as we start to let their, their real doctor know what we've done for them, giving them reports back. Um, so overall, it's just a higher patient acceptance. Now, a couple of the cons to doing this in-house where you have your own equipment, there's a little bit of a startup cost. Um, the equipment, while the ROI on the equipment is re really quite nice, an appliance or two, and it's all paid for, you know, your first couple of patients and the whole thing's paid for, um, the, you know, you do run the risk of having equipment break down and broken and you have to May, maybe pay for a part or a fix or something like that. Although we do have a little bit of a waiver, we have mostly paid when things 
when cords get pulled out and things like that, we, we usually just pay to fix them. And it's not exorbitant, um, the, the cost for broken down equipment all the time, but you do run a little bit of that risk. Um, the, the pros of the, the sort of the third party mailing model where, where you'll have a company that will mail your patient this is that you don't have that startup cost. You don't have to come up front for owning your own equipment. Um, so there's not a lot of risk in that for you. Um, there's not a lot of risk in the, in the, um, gotta make sure it's, my goodness. Okay. Um, when, when you're doing this, all the risk falls on the people sending that test. If it goes bad or they break it, that's on them. They're likely also in possession of a sleep physician that can read that for you. So really at that point, you just get the letter back from the physician saying, Hey, they probably need neural appliance. And you say, good, I know how to do that. Um, Again, it also offers this potential for multidisciplinary approach, but typically comes with some support. There's usually like a video to teach people how to do this so that they're not just kind of completely left out of there. The cons, however, are sometimes, again, we're getting a lower patient acceptance. Sometimes these things don't mail out for a few days or maybe even a few weeks. Um, it's also a little bit higher cost. Um, we charge 175 for our home sleep test. We've seen costs of, of take home sleep tests in the five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar range sometimes. Um, it gives you a little less control and it requires a little bit more time. Uh, Michael, you jumped on. Should we got yeah. something we want to talk uh, about? <laughs> well you started talking about workflow and we got a boatload of questions. So oh, I figure I'll I'll throw a couple in here and then we'll save the rest for the end. So um, when we get a boatload of questions, does that does that mean that like I have really piqued their interest or I did a horrible job of explaining it? No, it means that there's a lot of people awake listening to what you're talking about, oh, which is yay. good. Oh, yay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in your practice, since you own tests and you're handing these out, who hands those out? Whose job is that? Um, the answer to that is not me. Ever. <laughs> um, we, have, we have an assistant, uh, two assistants that are very capable in fitting them and showing them how they use. I also have sort of a medical and sleep billing and and sort of sleep liaison specialist that also does that. If if our if we're doing dentistry at the time, you know we can send them off to our our sort of sleep sleep girl in our office that can also do that. But yeah, most of the time that is I mean not most of the time, never is that ever done by by me. So it's part of yep. the workflow that that the team will get when you decide you want to get serious about sleep medicine you're going to want to get a team approach to that. You're going to want to get your whole team trained. And we're going to talk about where that might happen in a great way later, but that is done by the team without question. Yep. And uh, I will uh, tell you guys, uh, cause there's another question. How long does that typically take depending on the unit that you have anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes to get that unit assigned. Um, yep. I'm not going to ask Dr. Manning that since that isn't his job. Um, I'm guessing what Michael said is true because I've never uploaded one um, to go out and I've never uploaded one. Actually, I have uploaded one coming back and both of them is it's under a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so another question is, um, uh, what's the usual cost for the home sleep test equipment? Um, I'll go ahead and take that one yeah. uh, since that that's something that we, we do know uh, quite a bit about that. Um, that it's going to range anywhere from $3,200 up to $5,500, depending on the type of unit. Uh, there are multiple different home sleep tests out there with different channels. Uh, the one that Dr. Manning had earlier, the um, white res or uh, Phillips Respironics Alice Night One, that retails for $3,200. Uh, Knox T3S that will test children and also do uh, bruxism is going to be in the $5,500 range. So there are multiple different uh, units out there, and I wouldn't make the recommendation of purchasing a unit uh, without knowing what you're going to test for. If you really want to test kids in bruxism, then you need to go with a unit that's going to do that. If you're looking for a cost-effective unit that you can hand out um, in the practice, then that's something that, uh, you know, that there's other options out there as well. Um, one other question, I know you were going to ask this um, later on, but I'm going to kind of steal it right now since it's being it. asked. Let's do it. What's all the hype about Night Owl? Ha, so that's yeah. the little, the little finger yeah, there is. test. By the way, I was just wondering, who was asking that question? <laughs> no, me, that was man. stupid. That was so stupid. I wish I hadn't done it. I, I'm, I, I already <laughs> regret it. Um, 
We are going to talk about that a little bit later because it is making a little bit of a buzz um, in in that it was it was kind of quickly pushed through the FDA as an option that does not have to be mailed back. It, it's it's disposable, so it's not a it's not a multiple use kind of thing. That way, for patients that are worried about was this on somebody else at some point, it was not because yeah. that is a one time use sleep test. And I believe, Michael, are we going to talk about that a little more in depth? later or do we want to just do it right now? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it right now, you guys. Um, just because there are, I know there's a lot of people that are interested in that. Uh, the Night Owl is a brand new home sleep test. Um, to my knowledge, it's the newest one on the market. Uh, as Dr. Manning mentioned, it's FDA cleared. You may have seen our social media posts with Awaken to Sleep where we did some funny video with it on my finger. Um, it literally goes on your fingertip. It's a PAT probe that's going to measure peripheral arterial tension. Basically, what that means is uh, you're going to understand if the patient is asleep or not at night. If they're in REM sleep, you're going to understand if they have apnea or not. And it is, as Dr. Manning mentioned, disposable, and it's also a multi-night unit. Uh, so with disposable comes a slightly higher cost often, but with a uh, reusable test, you're going to have disposable costs that are less than a uh, night out. So there are pros and cons to every device that's on the market but it is the newest tech. It is uh, as sexy as a home sleep test gets because you went from all of those wires and an in-lab test to a cannula and an effort belt and a finger probe to just a finger probe with tape. So as with everything, uh, there's you know features and benefits and some drawbacks. It's a fantastic unit. We are uh, you know working with it. And um, yeah, if you guys have more questions on that, we can answer them a little bit later. Dr. Manning, thanks for letting me interject. Um, I'll let you get back to uh, to your flow here. Super. Um, it's probably worth jumping in and saying all of my home sleep testing equipment I bought from Awaken to Sleep, they're great about it. I get my disposables from there. Um, they, as for my money, they're they're great for that kind of stuff. I they do all my interpretations. They have board certified sleep physicians that are licensed in every state, so they're easy to use when I upload that to the portal. They they take pretty good care of me. They take good good care of everybody. I like to think I'm special and that they're taking extra special care of me, but they do the same for everybody. So that's a quick little plug when it comes to home sleep testing. If you're looking for equipment, they are a dealer for multiple different brands of equipment and, and they're great like that. Um, and again, um, when it comes to to home sleep testing from a third party standpoint. The new Night Owl is, is a great option. Uh, Michael carries years and years as a sleep tech. He's he's forgotten more about sleep than most people will ever know. And so, you know, he's, he's a great resource. Later, we're gonna do a Q and A, so hopefully he can jump back on. And if you have other questions about actual process of sleep studies, I mean, the guy's like a savant when it comes to sleep studies. So um, as a sleep tech, so moving along. Um, um, the process for a home sleep test, again, we identify, we have this screening protocol. We're gonna identify these patients um, as patients that are in need, you know, they're those that are quacking like a duck and walking like a duck. Yeah, 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 you get the idea. Uh, we send that home with them. They sleep in their house, in their own bed. We upload the data. We have it read by a sleep physician and we have them come back and we, we go through the physician interpretation. And we're gonna do that in just a minute. We're gonna go through a little of the physician interpretation. Not gonna be labor it a ton, um, but if it's appropriate at that point, we will suggest they have an oral appliance made. If it's inappropriate based on their diagnostics, then we wouldn't. We would either say, you don't need anything or we would send them for a CPAP machine. But that is sort of the process and it goes so easy. We're in the, in fact, the workflow is very team driven. Again, this workflow is we have the screening protocol, which is a fun topic for another night, how to start identifying these patients. But we, we go through a screening protocol and once we've started to identify this, this duck, um, you, you can see right here, you'll have somebody in your office, your sleep champion, or maybe it's a hygienist, maybe it's a front desk person. The patient will complete the forms necessary, these sleep screener forms. They'll take the home sleep study, they'll get it set up, they'll get them educated on how it works, and they'll get it assigned to them so that the data is personal to them. And then the patient takes it home, they sleep with it, and then they come back, we look at it together. Um, we'll send the data off again. We send ours for an interpretation. Uh, to wake and to sleep, and they get it, their physicians there get it read, 
they'll formulate a diagnosis and then then they will send it back to us and then what happens from there Ooh, topic for another day um but that is really the workflow there's not a lot of interruptions it is whether it's a hygiene patient or a, a new patient or whether it's an existing patient, but somehow we've started to kind of clue in based on a health history and things that we're seeing in the mouth, that this patient may be that, that daddy apnea duck, but we need to test them. We just start talking to them about it. Hey, I feel like this would be a good idea to test you because this, 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 and this, you're kind of, you're kind of freaking me out with this, 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 and this, it's kind of all coming together to maybe it has sort of more of an umbrella cause. And that could be something that's happening while you're sleeping. And they say, God, it could be, yeah, I sleep like crap. I wake up with headaches and blah, blah, blah. And they start telling you and like vomiting all of their symptoms. And at that point is like a great time. Like that's a really good time to say like, man, you seem super excited about this. Give me 175 bucks and I'm gonna get you diagnosed. Um, and they take it right then on the spot. And that is a good way to do it. Zero barriers there. There's no barriers. There's no third party sleep test. There's no PSG, you know, establishes a patient at another clinic you know, sleep someplace else, it's, it's super streamlined and easy to where we can find the same information, but it makes it easy on our patients. Um, at that, at this point, I just like to, because um, this, this is a slide in our weekend course, and I don't even really know what it means really, but it, it had the word journey in it. And so I thought I would start to, to just kind of take, I didn't really introduce myself and kind of what makes me tick at the beginning, but at this point, um, to kind of explain my journey, when I first started in dental sleep medicine, um, it kind of fell into my lap, actually. A friend of mine from the state of Washington said, hey, I'm coming down to Phoenix. And at the time I was living here in the greater Phoenix area, I said, I'm coming down to Phoenix to take a class over the weekend on sleep apnea. You should come with me. And I wasn't really super interested in it, but I was interested in seeing my friend that I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And so we took the class together. We stayed in Phoenix. We made it a guys weekend. It was awesome. Um, but along the way, we signed up to become members of the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, which means I made my way onto a list. Somewhere my name got on a list. And somebody from that list within a, about a year, I mean, I, I took this course and forgot all about it. And then a year later, somebody called me and said, hey, I noticed that you're a member of the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. I need a sleep appliance. And my office <laughs> girl scheduled him in and I, I told him, I'm like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I, he's like, well, I've had one before and it's this and that. I, yeah, I'll walk you through it and I just need you to be able to make me one. And I said, well, I'll just charge you my cost because I'm full disclosure. I have no idea what I'm doing. And so we did it and it turned out great. And he did really well. It just so happened that he wanted a second one because he was in the business of transportation and he was half the time in Michigan and half the time in Arizona and he would occasionally forget it. So he just wanted one at each place. Well, he was in transportation and he employed a lot of truckers, long haul truckers and things like that. And from a, a department of transportation standpoint, they had to be in compliance with sleep and sleep apnea guidelines. And so he started sending a lot of his patients over to me or his employees over to me. And it really started building some confidence. And we started doing a lot of them uh, by way of this guy. And as a result, we kind of thought, well, we're doing pretty good. Maybe we'll learn how to build our insurance and maybe we'll take some more courses and maybe we'll even market this a little bit to the general public. And we did, and the ball just started rolling. Um, that being said, that sounds really, really neat. Like, oh, this happened, it fell in his lap and then the ball started rolling. Look at this rolling ball. Um, when, it, when in actuality, we kind of describe this journey um, as hacking through the jungle with a machete. Because at the time when we started doing this back in 2009, um, there were not a lot of resources available. The American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine was available. There were a few labs that were kind of helping out in order to get you to send them work, they would kind of put some forms together. And we started with that, but we really learned from the School of Hard Knocks. I mean, it was a uphill battle. We, we gave away a lot of stuff. We lost a lot of money in the process, trying to figure it, figure it out. Um, but it really was a rough kind of journey for the first few years of trying to figure this out. Once we started figuring it out, we felt pretty good about things and, and we felt like we blazed this trail. And then a few years after I felt like I was really like hot stuff, I actually met Michael at Awaken to Sleep and um, 
and they kind of took my sleep practice to the next level. Um, I was already home testing at that time. I had a, a, a single year, two units of a different kind that I'm using now, and we were doing some of that. And, and I had to go out and make relationships with doctors and try to talk to them and get in their offices and talk to sleep labs and try to get in there and, and fiddle around. And it was a lot of legwork. It was a lot of going out and trying to meet people. And I'm, forget it, I don't like people. People don't like me. So I didn't like that part of it. So when I met Michael and, and, and awakened to sleep and they started showing me their process and how they've streamlined it and they've made it more simple, I just thought, well, this is like what I wished I would have had eight years ago because it sure would have made my life a lot easier. And so I tell you that my journey, while I'm really glad I took it because of where I'm at today, I really would have liked to have taken it a little easier. Um, but now there's so many resources. And of course, um, Awaken to Sleep, who's the sponsor of this, we appreciate them. They do a great job. They, they really do a great job of making this streamlined so that you don't have to spend your time hacking away through the forest. So um, that was a little bit of my journey. Um, I say that because a little bit later, they're going to offer a course now. I get it. I'm super engaging. I'm really funny. I wish you could see my whole body. I'm like an Adonis. I'm just super built. I'm like easy to look at. Um, you know, we're doing a course in a couple of weeks. It's a weekend course. When we used to do these courses live, we used to make people fly to us. We used to make people stay and buy hotels for their team. And we used to charge a lot of money, didn't we? Like several thousand dollars. Now that is to not say that this is not worth that kind of money, but, um, now that we can do these virtually, we're able to do that at a little bit less of our cost. So um, I only say that because I'm super engaging and awesome. And I'm going to be doing a course with Awaken to Sleep in a couple of weeks and again in May. So Michael, did you want to jump in on this? Because it's your course. I feel, I feel like I just took it all over. No, man, I think uh, I, I want to make sure because uh, we're close to time. I want to make sure we get to the q and I yeah. sincerely appreciate the kind words. And I mean, guys, we'll in, in a few minutes here after uh, the Q&A, we will have an offer for you. Um, you know, that way you guys can take care uh, or take advantage of the discount. The, the goal in this is to give you some nuggets to take home. So and I know that a lot of that is, frankly, when you get your questions answered. So I want to make sure we answer as many of those as possible yeah. tonight. Um, okay. That being said, uh, Dr. Manning, you have a compliment before I get to the questions. Someone says uh, your beard and your hair make you a very good looking dude. And I'm not going Thank to you. tell you who said that because then it would just spoil the surprise. Was it Dennis um, again? It was Dennis, wasn't it? No. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, okay. So uh, one, um, Martin asked, are home sleep tests as accurate and valid as a in-clinic sleep test or a polysomnogram? Um, I'll go ahead and take this one as the sleep tech uh, in the room. Um, the FDA has to clear every home sleep test in order for it to be used in the United States. That being said, there's multiple different sleep tests out there. So a blanket statement is yes. Every sleep test that's on the market currently has to be able to identify obstructive sleep apnea, and it has to do it within a level of accuracy according to an in-lab PSG. Almost every test out there is going to be, or pardon me, every test out there is going to be above 90% channel to channel accuracy. Some are 96%. So when you deal with that level of sensitivity and specificity in a home sleep test, the simple answer, Martin, is yes. If you're doing a home sleep test, it's absolutely accurate. The question is, are you testing for the right thing? Dr. Manning actually gave a lot of info on this earlier with relation to all of the different sleep disorders. Make sure that you're testing for obstructive sleep apnea or airway disorders that are within your scope as a dentist. If you're doing that, you're good to go with a home sleep test. If you're testing for REM behavior disorder, like waking up in Walmart with Cheerios in your cart, that's the wrong test. We want to send them to an in-lab one. Um, okay, uh, next question is, uh, I screen patients, but when I try to get them tested, most balk at this. Uh, suggestions on how to change this or tips on how to position the HST with the patient. So this, this is a group that has home sleep tests. Let's say they, let, let's say it's in your office. You have the home sleep test. You're trying to hand them out. The patients are balking at that. What do you do? 
Well, you know, I'd probably have to go back to a day when I wasn't awesome. Um, it is, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. Um, you know, the longer you go and the more you get your team calibrated, I, again, I'm not trying to dodge this question. Um, we can talk about a few things, but the longer you go and the more you get your team calibrated to talk about these kind of things and the more value you create when it comes to these things, far, far fewer people are going to, I will say, balk at it. There may be people that are hesitant to do that. You know, we'll, we'll ask them sometimes, you know, like, I'll just say, like, you seem hesitant to want to do this. Um, you know, is it, is it, you know, have you already had a test? Are you just nervous? You know, is there, you know, I, I, like anything else, people don't want to do dental treatment and they balk at dental treatment because they don't see the value in it or they don't feel like they need it. Um, and so, yeah, again, I'm, I kid around when I say back when we weren't awesome, but we've got a team and, and when we talk about it, we, we talk about it in a way that makes sense to them. We talk about it in a way that creates value for them and we've made it fairly affordable. Um, you know, from a, from a standpoint of, from a standpoint of um, this versus a, a polysomnogram, it's, it's far less expensive and it's far less invasive. So for us, we don't get a lot of that, but if you do, I would just recommend breaking down like what they're balking at and, and mm -hmm. see if that's a shortcoming for your practice. I'm not calling your practice out, but I'm saying, see if it's a shortcoming in value creation, because the other thing that we've got to always say, whether we're dentists or sleep dentists is we cannot care about the patient's health more than they do. You know, mm -hmm. we can't care about their teeth more than they do, but we can try, we can get, we can try to make them want to care as much as we do. Yep. Yep. And uh, we've got quite a few more questions here. So um, yeah, do I it. do want to, yeah, I, I do want to keep asking those. Um, I'm not asking the chili cheese fries questions. Sorry. I don't know who <laughs> asked that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to filter yeah. these. Thank you so much for the answer is yes, there. please. Um, how do we code for HST? Um, I know, uh, Dr. Manning, that's not your wheelhouse. Home sleep tests are coded depending on the channels. Most are going to be 95806. That's your four channel home sleep test. If it has more channels than that, double check how many and what they are. It may meet the 95800 criteria. 95806 or 95800. Um, Another one, uh, how do you deal with uh, relationships with the local sleep physicians when you refer patients for CPAP and you've already used your own units to test patients in your practice? Do you have any pushback? How have you handled that situation in the past? Um, no pushback necessarily. I think the fact that you're making a referral to them at all lets you know that you value them. And I feel like they feel like that. You know, I, I know that there are some that feel like we're taking business from them. Um, and we are, so that it's going to be sticky. Um, you know, we just want to be upfront with them and let them know like what we're doing. There's really not a great answer to that question other than you do want to find people and let them know like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And there's going to be quite a few of these patients that are going to, to need a CPAP and I need a place yep. to send them. Yep. Um, so I got another question here that did ask for that link again for the discount. I'm going to move. Let me see if I can grab that real quick. I did. Okay. Um, so guys, here is the link. Uh, we are going to send this to you in an email. I'll leave this up for a second if you guys want to take advantage of that. Or um, I think we've got a uh, chat. If you're in the chat, you can throw that in there. Um, so we've got the CE survey link in the chat now. And we've also got the link to the course. Um, all you have to do is go to that course. There's no code to enter and it's half off. Um, if you guys are not hanging out and doing anything on the 16th and 17th of April, you're welcome to hang out with us. If you love Dr. Manning's beard or his jokes, or you just want to learn more about sleep apnea and how to treat patients, we'd love to hang out with you. Uh, this is what we know. And we're, uh, respectfully, we're pretty good at helping teams go do great work in the practice. So uh, if you guys are interested in sleep and are either hitting hurdles or trying to start out, uh, like I said, we would love to have you there. We've got a few spots left, so uh, check it out. Michael, that is also for dentists plus four team members. That's correct. correct. Yeah, Thank we want to make sure that you, if you're going to do it, boy, bring the team along. They're going to drive this in your practice. Yep. Yeah, and guys, that's 14 CEs for each attendee. 
Uh, so the CEs start to get pretty cheap when it's uh, one fee for everybody. So if you want to take advantage of it, uh, do that before this Friday. The email will say that, but uh, the the deadline for the discount is going to be this Friday, the 9th at uh, midnight. So check that out before then. Um, let's get back to some of the questions here. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. We have, uh, yeah, <laughs> questions. Um, my patients are not using the HST correctly, even as we show them. Do you guys make a video for it? Uh, Juanita, that's an awesome question. Dr. Manny, do you want to take that? Well, I know that there's lots of videos made by the manufacturers. Uh, you know, we're using a ResMed unit. There's a video that shows how to do it. When they're not using it correctly, it's been our, it's been sort of our experience that nasal cannulas will come out. So we will use Band-Aids on the nasal cannula to hold it down. We'll also use something taped to the back of the hand or the finger to keep the pulse ox on there. Those are the two biggest things that, that go wrong. After that, it's about yep. hooking up a belt around your chest. So when they're not getting the results you want, it's usually one of those two things. That's what I do, Band-Aids, tape. Yep. And uh, to answer the question about the video, yes. Uh, one of the workflow items that uh, we talk about in the course is automating a text message and email system to send that link out to your patients with a video at uh, seven to nine o'clock at night. So that way they know exactly how to use it when they're at home instead of in your office and forgetting how to do it. Uh, so great question. Um, another one, where do I go to learn more about home sleep testing for my office? Um, shameless plug, I guys- I The would offer say, is still on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, we, we are gonna talk in detail about that uh, at the course. Uh, if you guys just wanna learn more about home sleep testing, how the services work, things like that, uh, you can go to awakentosleep.com. Uh, if you're on that site, we do offer complimentary uh, coaching sessions. So if you wanted to ask a sleep coach, hey, I'm looking at these three different devices and here's what I want to do. Which one's the best for my practice? We'll give you honest answers for free. So if you have questions like that that are specific to your office, uh, I would go check it out there and schedule a call with a coach. Uh, nothing beats free. So uh, let's hit that. Um, uh, Kevin, you've got a great question. Patients who are testing and they show mild to moderate sleep apnea, and um, are you going straight into oral appliance therapy? Are we looping in their primary care physician? And how does that uh, affect medical insurance coverage? So Dr. Manning, that I'll was let a loaded you start question. that one. Yeah. First of all, yes. I'll hit it. I, if I test somebody and I have a sleep physician read and interpret that, and they send back a recommendation for oral appliance therapy, which they will if they are mild or moderate, I go right into that. Now, I still loop in their physician with a letter. It lets them know what I'm doing. It lets them know why I'm doing it. It has a copy of the sleep study. It has a copy of the treatment. Now, I will even go as far as to send them in the letter. It will say that I will send, be sending them an efficacy study, which is a second sleep study used a few months after they've been on their, been using their oral appliance to check for effectiveness and, and send that as well so that the physician knows. Again, general physicians are dying for us. They don't realize it until they start using us, how much they need us. And that mm -hmm. sounds, that sounds arrogant, but they have people that are just driving them crazy because of sleep apnea and the symptoms that it creates and they can't use a CPAP machine. So the fact that we're driving this ship and they don't have to, and they're being successfully treated for their symptoms and the physician gets this off their plate. I actually used to market to physicians to say, send me your headaches, send me the crap, yep. send me the stuff that you don't want to deal with anymore. I'll take care of it. Yep. And I'll, I'll add a little bit of uh, medical billing flavor to that answer as well, Kevin. Um, there are some insurances that are going to require that the patient have a face-to-face -face with that physician. So as Dr. Manning just mentioned, he'll send a letter and request some documentation from that doctor. There are some insurances that'll require face-to-face. -face. Uh, the cool thing about that is that next month, uh, perfect parlay into our uh, telemedicine webinar next month, Dr. Jadeep Bijwadia is gonna join us. He is a extremely well-versed sleep physician who's gonna be talking to us about the sleep physician perspective on telemedicine and how that relates to the screening all the way to the prescription for the appliance. Uh, we're gonna interlace medical billing guidelines into that conversation and just an overall workflow. 
So if you've got a local doc that's not willing to write an order or see the patient and they're not on board, there's an answer for that. And uh, it's, it's a very streamlined one. So it's, it's a perfect parlay. This is, uh, if you guys wanna check it out, um, that is gonna be May 4th at uh, the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern. So that's the first Tuesday of May, if you wanna check that out. Um, another question, I, again, I'm trying to get through these because we do have a bunch. Um, can my team dispense the home sleep test or do I have to physically do it? It seems like it would save a lot of time if my front desk could do it for me. Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. If you're the doctor and you're touching a home sleep test, shame respectfully, on you. shame. <laughs> we said this is home sleep testing the right way. That's yeah. the wrong way. You're the yes. doctor. You front desk assistant, hygienist, you train two or three people to do it and then never touch them again. Yep. Cool. Um, Dr. Manning, uh, what do you think about the Medibyte Junior? I don't know anything about Medibyte Junior. Sorry, you caught me. Yeah, I, I knew I'd get one. Yeah. Um, I, I, Dennis, uh, this is your buddy from Ohio. Um, Dennis, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer. Uh, the Medibyte Junior has been around for a long time. They are based in Canada, so sometimes getting supplies is rough. Um, and uh, their system is ingrained, meaning you don't have access to the raw data in your local software. From what I understand, uh, it's an online portal that you have to upload data into. Um, so again, uh, specific units looking at specific needs in the practice, it's a very important thing. Um, there are other units out there that have the same types of channels that have a, an easier software interface. So maybe something to look at. Um, how do we code for the HST? We got that. Um, FDA requires at least 90% accuracy. Uh, oh, the FDA requires at least 90% accuracy. Are the misdiagnosed 10% typically false positives or false negatives? How to correct a misdiagnosis? That's from Brian. Um, Brian that sounds like a sleep a, tech question there. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so 10% is not uh, misdiagnosed, to be uh, clear. We're talking channel to channel accuracy, meaning in an in-lab sleep test, you have channels that are recording raw data from the patient's electric signals and, and bio uh, feedback, if you will. When it receives that data, it's scored either by a program or a technician, likely both. There's inner score variability among that data that's recorded from in-lab testing. And that data is paired up against home sleep tests. So when we talk about a channel-to-channel -channel accuracy, we're not talking about misdiagnosis. Uh, that's a, a misuse of the term. But to be specific on that, if there is ever a situation where a home sleep test isn't picking up enough data in those channels, it's never going to equate to a false positive. So one of the things in using, utilizing a home sleep test is if you use it and the patient has symptoms and they come back negative, the next step in the protocol is either to retest again with a home sleep test or in adding multiple nights typically, or to refer for an in-lab test for further testing. So that's the, the protocol from a home sleep test standpoint. That's an awesome, very detailed question. Um, okay. Uh, Jeffrey's got a couple of CBCT airway volume questions. Um, do you ever use CBCT airway volume in CR versus protrusion to see if there is a benefit for oral appliance therapy? Um, I can how take would that you determine one. if that's work? Yeah. Yeah. So we definitely use the CBCT on all of our sleep patients. Um, the hard part about it, again, is CBCT is a screening tool and not a diagnostic tool. So you can look at volumes um, on CBCT in, a, in sort of a CR and a, in a protrusion position. It's just odd how sometimes it will work out and sometimes it will not. Um, it's sort of the same idea. Doing that is sort of the same idea as these rhinometry and pharyngometry where they're trying to detect where you might have an interference. We use CBCT. They use like sonar or something like that. There again, there's so many things that go into airway stability that we do during the day 
that we don't do at nighttime. So again, there are things that you can look at, but they're, they're a great screening tool. You can look at some volumes when you're moving things around. It might give you an idea as if they are apneic, if they may be a better candidate or a better responder. But again, unless we're getting data when they're asleep, I, I've never really snored when I'm not asleep and I've never really choked myself out when I'm, a, when, I mean, I'm sorry, when I'm awake, I've never choked out while I'm awake on yep. my own tongue. So it, it, we just have mechanisms that won't let us do that when we're awake. So yep. we'll even do those during a CBCT, even if we're in protrusive or retrusive or incentric, we're still going to be use, utilizing muscles to stabilize our airway that we may not at night. So again, they're great screening yep. tools. I love showing it. I love pulling it up and showing them the constrictions spots in their airway or right around the spot where most people with apnea have that, you know, ours are colored, you know, green, good, red, bad, but, but again, yep. it's not ever going to take the place of a sleep test. Yeah. Um, so on that note, uh, what do you think about, uh, pharyngometers, rhinometers, 20 seconds? I need 10 seconds. Um, they're fine. If any screening tool that you can get to help make a patient say yes, I'm fine with. I don't use it. Um, I, do, I don't think it's necessary necessarily. I know people will disagree with me. I'd be happy to talk with them if they do. But anything that is a screening tool that can help patients say yes, I'm all, I'm all for. Just because yeah. I don't use it doesn't mean it doesn't have some validity in the market. Yep. Uh, another question, if the obstructions in the sinus or related to nasal patency, does the HST work the same in detecting events? Uh, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, nasal obstruction does not cause apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea happens when the oral cavity collapses, um, typically at the base of the tongue. So if you have a nasal collapse, you naturally will open your mouth. You won't even wake up for that event typically. Um, there are some snoring events in the nasal passage that will wake you up but it's not going to cause obstructive sleep apnea. All right. Um, uh, one more uh, billing question uh, from Adrian. I don't have a clear answer if we can bill insurance for home sleep test as dentists. Uh, the answer is yes, you can. The big question is, will they pay? And that answer is very unclear, Adriana. Yeah. So we do, let me are, just tell her, let me just tell her yeah. in a 10 second. Um, we bill a lot of medical insurance. We bill for even some dental procedures. We bill for our CBCTs. We do not bill for home sleep tests um, because it's become a colossal waste of our time. We are a full fee for service model. We, if patients really wanna pursue it, we can give them the necessary paperwork to pursue um, having that $175 paid for, but they can do the footwork because it, it just, we're just unsuccessful at that. It just happens to be something that we were unsuccessful at. Okay, last question, and this tells us that we are past our time. Someone asked, uh, what do you think about people that refer to crayons as Crayolas? Yeah, well, here's the deal. I'm fine with Crayolas. What I'm not fine with is C-R-E-N-S, Krenz. I got a friend who says Krenz, and it drives me crazy. Like, I got a box of Krenz. <laughs> can't, can't do it. Can't do it. Awesome. Well, guys, I guess on the uh, Crin's note, uh, we'll end this thing. Um, just a recap, if you are looking for your CE certificate, the link is in the chat. We will also get an email by 7 p.m. Pacific time. That's uh, in the next 45 minutes. It will be in your inbox. If it's not in your inbox, it is in your spam box. So check that, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Click the survey link. It will take you 37 to 42 seconds uh, to finish that sucker and uh, you'll get your CE cert. Also the course offering, uh, there'll be a link in that email. So check that out if you're interested in hanging out with us for the April course. And other than that, please uh, don't miss Dr. Jagdeep Bijwadia talking about telemedicine and home sleep testing. If you miss it, you will regret it. Don't do it. It's gonna be good stuff. Dr. Manning. Any uh, closing words on that note? Two things. One, if you're really looking to take your, your sleep practice to the next level, it will have to have home testing. I just don't see any successful sleep practices that are not initiating their own tests in states where it's allowed, at least. And second, thanks to Awaken to Sleep and Somnomed for putting on this course tonight. It's been a fun night for me anyway. Sorry if it hasn't been for everybody else, but it's been really fun for me. 
It's always fun watching you do your thing, Dr. Manning. <laughs> we appreciate you. All right, you guys have a wonderful night and uh, we will see you next time. All right.